I have uh, had the distinct pleasure of working at the Half and Reference Museum, the RISD Museum, and now at the Harvard Art Museums. And I'm going to talk about all three of those places today. And in my current role, I occupy a pretty unique place between ancient art and museum education. And so I thought that because I have the chance to use this platform that the Half and Reffer has very generously given me to talk about anything I want related to archaeology, that I would use it to talk about that intersection. And I watched the previous three talks and I thought that this could also be a nice moment of synthesis, synthesis because each of the previous speakers came from a different angle that I've also explored in my work. Um, and I enjoyed them so much that I thought it'd be nice to build on those presentations. So Annalisa earlier this month talked a lot about her personal journey and her personal experiences. Pinar uh, after that talked a lot about teaching and Michelle last week talked about materials and practice, which Pinar did as well. So today I wanna touch on all of those things. Uh, the work I do now and how I got here, the intersection between archaeology and teaching, because of course, archaeology education is an important facet of archaeology, and the importance of material encounters in my museum work, where I straddle this really delicious line between ancient art and museum ed. But I want to prepare you now, and Leah did a little bit of this for me, that this will not be the same format as the other talks, because I want this to be interactive. Um, I think we've all spent way too much time on Zoom. It's a stressful time. I want to hear what you think. I want you to have some fun. And I want to look at some objects and talk about them with you. So I'm in, going to encourage you to be brave. Um, use the chat or raise your hand to chime in. And please feel welcome to share your ideas. And all of that is pretty much what I tell students when we start looking at a work of art in the museum or now online. Um, so let's start by putting ourselves in their shoes. I always like to start with some close looking as a warm up exercise. So I'm going to show you an object from our collection at the Harvard Art Museums. And I would love for you to tell me what you see. And for now, I'm going to ask that we try that out using the chat. So here it is. So don't worry about being right or wrong. You can just describe what you see. Lots of white, thank you. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. So uh, it's a okay. Rachel is pointing out that it's a photograph. It's a photograph of pyramids. Um, Annalisa points out there's lots of white. So there's a lot of uh, background space. It's kind of landscape, um, actual figures and things not occupying a huge amount of space. Um, pyramids. Flannery says Giza. Yes, it is Giza. In fact, mm -hmm. what else do you see? Lots of different textures. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. So maybe you're thinking here about the texture of this sand. Looks like there could be some footprints here. Um, okay, solar panels. Interesting. This is that's definitely something that people say a lot. That these look like big solar panels, and you know, Egypt is really um, very sunny, very warm. So why not? Um, the people, thank you for pointing that out. The people are so small. Decades ago, judging by the cars, yes. Um, yeah, panels in the foreground. Um, a couple people describing them as like boards of some kind, maybe solar panels. Great. Ah, a photo that brings ancient Egypt into the modern world. Stacy, I love that comment. Okay, and repeating shapes. Excellent. That's great. Um, any other observations about the kind of moment this is or what these people are doing here? Anything else that's sort of like um, active in this photo? Someone mentioned it looks like they're setting up for something. Yeah, and actually, can you say a little more or anyone feel free to jump in in the chat, say a little more like what do you see that makes you think they're setting up for something? Ooh, perhaps an exhibit setup like an event, maybe they're tourists. Ah, that's so interesting. So if you have great eyesight, uh, unlike me, you might be able to see the direction these people are looking in. Leah suggests that maybe they're looking um, in a certain direction, looking from a distance, unloading items from the truck to set up. Okay, great. That's awesome. Okay. Looks like they're taking things out of the cars. Okay. I wanna just go back to what Stacy said about textures before. Um, and just uh, 
think a little bit about the fact that this is a photograph. Um, if you have any comments about um, how you you feel that the medium here uh, of photography is representing this landscape and these actions that are happening at Giza. Almost looks like a film set, yeah. Can, can you say more about why, why that? Is it because it's a photo and it's black and white and you're sort of seeing it framed or is there some other reason? Taken facing away, yeah, from the city. Exactly like that. Okay, so fr it's framed, it's black and white. There's something that the medium is doing here that makes it maybe look like, um, uh, like it's a film set. Okay, it was like looking at a memory of something. Oh my gosh, I love it. Okay, um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop there, but I wanted to just, this is such a great um, great activity to do to start, uh, to start out together, I think, because most of us don't spend so much time looking at images or objects in this way. Um, it's really nice to, to get like this kind of um, fresh look and to sort of, um, to start to dig your heels into a, to a new program by looking together in this way. Um, so here's some information about this work. Uh, it's, it's called Desert Advertising. These are actually advertising uh, billboards. And it's by the American photographer, Richard Barnes, and it was taken in 1991. Um, and I wanna ask you uh, to, to say whether it was jarring or strange for you, or maybe not at all, um, to start by looking at an object like this, a photograph, instead of something ancient. Definitely unexpected, but maybe not jarring. Okay. If this photo is very clearly of Egypt, so it's certainly related. Other thoughts on that? Still looking at something ancient, yes. <laughs> Not really, because modern times are encroaching on ancient areas. Excellent. And Hannah says, I think in the digital age, we can forget that photographs can be objects too. Yes, thank you. That's kind of what I wanted to get out of here. Um, so my colleagues, um, Amy Brower and Susanna Ebbinghaus, put this photo and others like it on view in our Egyptian gallery in 2019. And what I love about it is what some of you said, it really speaks to the ancient and the modern coming together in one place. And it also reminds us that Egypt is populated by Egyptian people today, and also by tourists, um, and that life continues in this space that non-Egyptian learners often think of as very far away and very distant, both geographically and temporally. Uh, so I started with this photo today, not randomly, um, but because I recently used it at the start of another program. So I wanna clarify first that most of the teaching I do is at the college level, but I use this in summer 2019 with a group of sixth grade ancient civilizations teachers from Massachusetts as part of a professional development workshop on teaching about the ancient world. And I'm gonna say more about that program later. Um, and I think that doing that really changed their perspective on the gallery and on all the other artifacts that we looked at afterwards. And after we used this photo together before COVID, <laughs> they had decided to show this same photo in their classrooms when they started teaching about ancient Egypt because they thought that it would help their students think about how we imagine Egypt, um, our perceptions, uh, preconceptions, biases, and that then once students had become aware of those things, then they'd feel ready to introduce some ancient Egyptian material into their classrooms. So now you can probably get a sense of the way I think about creating encounters with ancient Egypt through objects. And I wanna walk you through some of the experiences that shape the way that I think about that. Uh, and those really centered on the Hathen Refer Museum and the RISD Museum. So I'm gonna say a bit about the programs that I participated in there that I think are really um, stellar. And it gave me the tools to do what I do now. And then I'm gonna finish up by saying a bit about some of the things that I am working on right now at the Harvard Art Museums where you can really see those influences. So we're gonna go back, back, way back uh, to 2013, my second year of my PhD, when I was a proctor at the Haffenreffer Museum. So a proctorship is a semester of service and training that grad students at the Joukowsky Institute get to do in various places. And my proctorship at the Hafenreffer 
meant that I got to spend a lot of time in the culture lab, which is this fabulous space where students and also members of the public can encounter real artifacts up close. Has anyone been to the culture lab? And if so, what did you see or do there? <laughs> Someone says, no. Okay, attended, uh, ah, okay, uh, Susan, you're getting ahead of yourself. We're gonna talk about the exhibition. Um, been with a class on the anthropology of museums, okay. Um, oh, Annalisa thinks she's been to the literal same program that we're seeing here in this picture with Terry, okay. Okay, um, if you, oh, there we go. You see the Usyk, okay, fabulous. Yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, the Half and Upper collection is really amazing. There's so many different things that you can see and so many different um, curricular connections that you can make to classes at Brown and also other places in the Rhode Island area. Um, so spaces like the Culture Lab exist in a lot of museums that have teaching and collections. And for most people who won't go on an excavation in their lifetime, they can give people the most intimate encounter they're ever going to have with the material past. There's no plexiglass here, no cases, it's you and the artifacts, and sometimes you even get a chance to handle them. And I had never seen that done before in person in a museum. I had worked at other museums, I would worked on excavations, and I had taught students with artifacts as they came out of the ground. But here, it was like witnessing this rapture, like a kind of joyous and unadulterated encounter with the things that people in the past had really made and used and touched. And it was very clear to me that this was an important practice to share with people as often as I could. Um, and while I was a proctor, I decided that it would be a good idea to look into the Half and Refer's small ancient Egyptian collection. Brown as a whole has a couple of Egyptian collections. One is housed at the Joukowsky Institute. Another was at the Department of Egyptology and Assyriology, but now it's actually at the Half and Refer. It's part of their collection. So anyway, I thought, let's see what's here. Um, and there is some pretty awesome stuff. Uh, so here's a school of bronze votive fish. Um, here are the front and back of part of a sistrum, which is a musical instrument. It's kind of like a rattle with the face of the goddess Hathor. Um, and this is still one of the coolest objects I've ever worked with at any museum. It's a clay mold for a bead in the form of a rosette. So that's where that bead would be pressed in. Um, and the lines that you see here on the surface, those are ancient fingerprints. So I asked for some of this stuff to come to the culture lab and I would work on researching it during open hours. And then when people came in, I would invite them or actually like, I was probably a little bit pushy. I would implore them to come and, and take a look. Um, so I've, anonymize these lovely people because I don't know if they want to be in this presentation, but here's a family who put the museum gloves on and held real ancient Egyptian artifacts for the first time. And um, they could feel the weight of these objects and imagine how they would have felt in ancient hands um, and what materials they were made from. But I want to also say that this wasn't just about the sensory encounter. We also talked about what we thought these objects were and what I was trying to find out about them and how we know what we know. And I also want to mention that the Joukowsky Institute has done something like this for International Archaeology Day for many years now. Uh, this is an image from a couple of years ago. You might see yourself in it uh, if you're visiting from Brown. Um, and in, in a situation like this, Brown staff and students would take artifacts out for members of the public to explore. Um, and as many of you know, International Archaeology Day is every October, and this year it was just uh, last weekend, so very timely. So this week I went looking for the poster for IED from 2013 when I had just started working uh, with the Half and Refer objects. And here it is. Uh, I did not design this, by the way, um, but I think it is really beautiful. I'm going to ignore the fact that someone put play with ancient artifacts on there. Um, because I don't think we would phrase it like that anymore. Um, I, but my part here, which I put the box around, was described as discover ancient Egyptian secrets, which is definitely intriguing, um, but maybe plays into the idea that Egypt is other and mysterious in a way that is a little problematic. Although um, it does describe in a way 
the research process that we decided to model at the Half and Refer that weekend. So that included, among other things, uh, a live demonstration that I did with public participation where we performed a raking light photography technique called reflectance transformation imaging or RTI on an old kingdom relief in the Half and Refer collection. So that's an image of the demonstration. There's me. Um, that's, I think that's my friend Jess. Um, and this is the kind of inscribed information that we were using raking light to try and see on this object. And I really credit this experience where I wasn't just looking at objects with curious people, but also actively finding out new information about the objects with curious people with the big idea that came next. And that was uncovering ancient Egypt. So after a couple of years of research on the Half and Refer collection and the other Egyptian collections at Brown with my friend, Julia Troche, who was also an Egyptologist, we mounted this exhibition at the Half and Refer. And it was designed to activate Brown's collections of Egyptian artifacts, which are often fragmentary and most of which don't have archeological context as teaching tools. And we decided that the best way to make it clear that every object counts was to show how and how much we can learn from a single artifact using different research methods carried out by different specialists in the Brown universe. And that does a number of things. It makes the artifact a locus of knowledge. It introduces people to scholars and humanizes them. You get a face and a name. Uh, and it makes their expertise and their research process accessible. And then building on all of those things, it gives the visitor the tools and the skills to explore and also understand artifacts for themselves. Uh, so this is such a trip down memory lane, putting these slides together. So here's Julia, um, my co-curator, examining one of these ceramic funerary cones. Um, I say it's a cone, obviously it doesn't look like a cone now. It used to be cone shaped. So imagine there's like a pointy part that comes down sort of where her hand is, it's not there anymore. We only have the inscribed bits that used to be on the, the, the flat end of the cone because the rest of the cone was cut or broken off at some point. But because it was broken and you can see the inside, we could say something about the way that it was fired. And because of that, we could use these objects to introduce the science of ceramics. So this that you see here, this became this, um, a case with the cones here and some other ceramic objects that were made using different technologies um, and a bit about who Julia is as a researcher and what she did to investigate these objects and what that process can help her and us understand about them. And I also want to mention that Julia has an article coming out soon about the funerary cone, so it's definitely worth it. I talked to her about this yesterday and she was like, finally, you know, years later. Um, so similarly, Andreas Winkler, who was a postdoc at Brown then, and my colleague Christian Casey, who was a grad student then, reading these Egyptian texts and participating in research by translation, became a part of the exhibition focused on different languages and scripts and how we know what these artifacts say and what people can look for on their own when they see text on an artifact. I often tell people that archaeologists use ordinary things to do extraordinary things. We use household brushes to clean dirt. We use dental tools to articulate bones. We used x-rays and CT scans to see inside the wrappings of this ibis mummy. Um, imagine being a kid who's broken their arm and uh, at some point in the past, you know what it's like to have a broken bone. You come to the museum and you see that this ibis also got an x-ray. You would understand what the x-ray does um, and then you can apply that here to that artifact and this is also a great way to explain why we don't need to unwrap mummies of any kind in order to understand them um, and that of course became part of the exhibition too and uh this is not the only the, not the last example but it's just another one i'll give you that that relief and the technology of rti 
did also. Um, we demonstrated this using this brilliant LED light box that Rip Gary at the Half and Refer designed. So people could turn the lights on and off in different combinations that let them see different parts of the inscription and in raking light for themselves. And then to understand, again, that something really simple, just, just light um, and something really ordinary can give us a lot of information about an artifact. So notice this, that is our iPad interface, uh, which allows visitors to explore objects and research technologies that interest them in more detail. And I say that in the present tense because it actually still lives online. So um, you can click through it. The, the link is there for you to explore. Uh, I have obviously not touched it since 2016. Um, uh, maybe there are some updates there to the research, but you can sort of see what it was like and click through it. Um, and I actually just designed that in PowerPoint and made it a PDF and made it look like an app and an iPad. Um, uh, but you can, you can click on it as a PDF. So all of those experiences at the Half and Refer showed me how to use objects as a jumping point for people's questions and observations. Um, and they also helped me figure out how to create high impact programming for the public. But it was with the RISD Museum that I had my first real foray into exploring archeology span in ancient Egypt in classrooms. I mean, not college classrooms. Has anyone heard of this program before? And if so, uh, what do you know about it? And I think you can pop that in the chat, but if you would prefer to raise your hand and, and say, we can take one person. Maybe no one's heard of it before. Ah, Pinar, Pinar was an instructor. Okay, we'll talk about what that means in a second. So there's at least one other person here who's actually done this program, not just heard of it, okay. I have a couple of people who've been an instructor for Think Like an Archaeologist. Okay. No one's saying a little more about what it actually is, so I can jump into that in the interest of time. So um, this is another proctorship I had, actually. Oh, thank you, Emily. Emily just put the link uh, to the, the site that I'm showing you a screenshot of in the chat. Um, this is another proctorship that I had um, the year after the one at the Half and Refer. Uh, and this program is one that the Half and Refer also participates in. So does the Rhode Island Historical Society and the Joukowsky, along with the RISD Museum. So Think Like an Archaeologist brings archaeologists, anthropologists, and museum educators into Providence Public Schools. Specifically, they go into uh, sixth grade social studies classrooms. And the program gives students a chance to explore what archaeology is like, all the different kinds of methods that we use. But it does something else that um, is kind of like lying under the surface. Uh, archaeology is, is the, the vehicle for this, but it's really about building critical thinking and writing skills, figuring out how we learn about the past and how we assess historical facts, learning how to solve problems together, and learning how to draw hypotheses from different sources of information. The program is free. And it's reached over a thousand students across five middle schools since it started around a decade ago. Um, I just think this is such a great model of community archaeology and also public service. And I really think it's like the crown jewel of archaeology education in Rhode Island. It taught me so much. Um, so these are the demographics of the schools that we visited in the year when I participated the first time around. I actually did um, it's a kind of a long story. I participated in more than one, more than one time. Um, so students are really diverse um, with a Hispanic majority, and most of them are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And their schools are designated as uh, what's called Title I. That means that they receive special funds because they have a high concentration of low-income students. So this is a nice chance to serve a diverse community of students um, who might not have the resources that some of their peers at other schools have. And in addition to working with students who are native English speakers, the program has also been used in classrooms with ELLs or English language learners. So there are four classroom sessions that explore the basis, basics of archaeology in different ways. And then there's a fifth visit to a museum. So that's either the RISD Museum, the Half and Refer, or the John Brown House Museum. Um, and the classroom sessions, they're really, uh, they get students ready and excited for that museum visit. Um, and then when they get to the museum, they can apply similar concepts to the artifacts that they're going to encounter there. Um, and some students will not have 
been to a museum before uh, doing this with this, this program. So it's an important way of introducing museums as welcoming spaces to some students. Uh, so remember, ordinary materials do extraordinary things. Um, here are some boxes of wheat chaff uh, laid out and ready to be excavated for session three, which is the simulated dig. And I remember preparing for some of these classroom sessions. We had one where we did ceramic reconstruction. Uh, and I remember standing in my apartment with a hammer and a cheap vase that I bought at Salvation Army and wrapping it in a towel and breaking it into pieces so that students could put it back together the next day, like a giant puzzle, like ceramicists do. Um, and I remember going through my kitchen cabinets to find like parts of obscure appliances that no 12 year old would recognize uh, for the part that we did on reading an artifact. Um, and in that part, we were thinking about the assumptions that people make about the past today and how people in the past use objects in ways that might not be familiar to us and how they attach meanings to things that may be elusive to us now. So for the students who got to go to the RISD Museum for the final session of the program, um, they start by looking at an artifact together um, to practice making further observations in the galleries. And they do that using a really brilliant worksheet. So here it is. Um, and I'll just give you a second to look at it. Um, you can imagine how these questions can help structure students looking. And they also taught me how to structure students looking. Um, and it's also bilingual, of course, because many of the students are bilingual. So does anyone want to guess what we're going to do next? I promise you won't have to draw. I think people are getting nervous. So um, we're going to try this out. Uh, I'm going to show you an object from the RISD Museum, which students in the Think Like an Archaeologist program have actually used with this worksheet. And we're going to try answering some of these questions ourselves in the chat. So again, I'm not going to ask you to draw, but if you decide that you want to draw, you have a piece of paper near you and you want to show us later, I would love to see it. Um, so humor me. Um, put yourself in the shoes of a young person who is just exploring archaeology and the ancient world for the first time. And let's see what this feels like. So we'll go piece by piece. I know I haven't shown you the artifact yet. I will. Um, piece by piece. So the first question, if your answer's in the chat, is write words that describe this artifact. Write words that describe this artifact. And I'll give you about two minutes to do this. Colorful, thank you. Painting, red, blue, yellow, Egyptian. Yeah, stone, maybe limestone. Oh, you're getting ahead of yourselves. We're gonna talk about materials flat with lots of browns and grays and yellow, smooth, rocky, sandy, inscribed, dry, sandstone. Everyone is going materials. Writing, thank you. Carved with writing on it, great. Hieroglyphs, engraved. What else, what do you see on it? Is there a person? Portrait, <laughs> yeah, there's a person. Um, this is a male presenting person, okay. Birds, oh yeah, here, there's a bird here. I would not wanna be this bird, this bird is dead. Um, figure with a staff, okay. He's also got this sort of baton in his hand tools, maybe that's what this person was referring to. Um, great, okay, geometric, interesting, because we have this beautiful border around it. Okay, alphabet, thank you. Um, wonderful, man with staff, table, this is the table, wig, excellent. Um, a couple of people, <laughs> Annalisa says I love his outfit, honestly, I do too. Um, it, has, it has meaning, um, as I'm sure you can imagine. We can talk about that. So um, a couple of people have mentioned that there is a text here. Um, I promise that I will tell you what that says, um, but we have a, sort of the basics that you've noticed. There is a person here, he's holding some uh, stuff that um, uh, we can get into what it means, but he, he has a, some kind of position, uh, maybe a powerful position, um, and there's some text that relates to him and there's a bunch of stuff here, including some food, great. Awesome, okay, ready for the next question. So the next question is what materials is it made out of? And I know that you already answered this a little bit, but go for it. 
Um, sandstone, this is a very good suggestion. I can see how you would say that uh, because of the texture, but it is in fact limestone. Yeah, great, limestone. It does look like clay. A couple of people have said clay. Um, and I think it's because there's some restoration around the edges of the, um, maybe are a little bit misleading. Um, and yes, pigments. Yeah, there are paints here that are made using uh, mineral pigments mixed with some kind of binder. Um, so I'm gonna ask a more complicated question. I'm deviating from that worksheet for a second. How did you know it was stone? And I, what, I, what I'd love for you to do when I ask this question is like, can you describe, point to an area that looks stony to you? And the reason why I'm asking you to do that is because I find myself having to explain this to students of all ages all the time, that there's like something that you're seeing that you're using as an analogy to draw your conclusion. So you don't, you know that it looks like stone because you've seen something else that looks like stone, but describe an area. There we go, the edges. Thank you, the bottom left, the chipping here, yeah. I think that would be how I would guess it was limestone too that you see that it's kind of uneven, you see that it breaks on the edges in the way that stone does, you see maybe the marks of a tool that's been used either to carve it or in this case probably to dislodge it from where um, it was uh, originally. There's someone here who studies limestone <laughs> It says that's how I know, but yes, chipping, bit of a variation in the color, awesome. Yes, and part, thank you, parts that are recessed or carved in. So this is um, the type of decoration here, by the way, is called relief. This is raised relief where the person's body is raised above the surface of the background, the background's cut away. Here, this is sunk relief where the, um, the hieroglyphs are carved sunk down under the level of the surface, two types of relief. Okay, Whew. here we go. Next question, how do you think this artifact was used? Instructions for doing something. Ooh, I love that. Ah, I. Okay, Mary, I, Mary asked if it's maybe an ancient grocery list and you were like the 10th person to suggest that. Usually that gets suggested with me in person with this object because we have a whole bunch of stuff. And in fact, there is actually a list of stuff here. Um, wonderful, okay. Decoration in a tomb, lots of people saying a tomb. Uh, I see that some of those people are familiar with Egypt. So I'm gonna, there's a lot of uh, preconceptions that you have there. Um, uh, <laughs> yes, okay. So there's, people are sort of speculating about the, the text being really important in different ways, different kinds of guesses about that. Uh, memorialization, someone says, an edict. Um, so uh, the text is really important to understanding how this was used. Um, not a lot of people in ancient Egypt were literate, but um, it still sort of performed its work. Uh, anyway, and I will talk about it in a minute. That's awesome. Okay, so we're going to do the last last question. Describe the artifact's condition. This is your opinion, but I would love for you to say, you know, some bit of evidence that you see and then give your, your verdict. So describe this artifact's condition. Restored-ish, broken on edge. Okay. Museum quality. Susan, why is it museum quality in your opinion? And is that, and it, don't just say, uh, <laughs> because it's in the RISD Museum. Yeah, it has some pigments that remain on it. Great, some of the colors are bright, some have faded. Yeah, okay, so maybe a mixed bag. Um, Annalisa says it looks pretty great to me with the restoration and the filled in spots. It's been touched up. Yes, it has been touched up. Sophia says it's very well preserved, well preserved. Great, paint remains basically full picture with the border, yeah. Um, Bradley says the artifact was in perfect condition uh, considering the amount of time um, it's been since it was excavated. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, this one, maybe it's a mixed bag for some of you. I always like to say that I hope I'm going to look this good in 4,000 years. This is 4,000 years old and it has the paint on it. But yes, there are breaks and stuff like that uh, too. Um, to think about it, the RISD Museum acquired its collection for students of art and design to learn from uh, everything in the collections. And I think that you can see really easily with this artifact, like that this this could do that that work for inspiring artists and designers um, through its color and through um, so the the formulaic nature of it and its border and, and the fact that it's just really uh, beautiful. Um, so before I tell you a little bit more about this, um, I would love to hear a little more in the chat um, from some of you about how 
that felt to use that worksheet. I know you're adults, you know, sixth graders, maybe some of you are sixth graders. Um, but you know, how did you feel doing that? And, and what do you think that kind of structured looking can do for students who have just learned about archaeology um, as a way of encountering their first museum object together? Do you think it works? Ah, we have a seventh grader here. So you're not a sixth grader either. Excellent job. Yeah, so how did that feel? What are your thoughts on that kind of structured looking with these big open questions? Makes you think critically in ways that guide you with how to look at history and artifacts in general, Lauren says, yeah. I think it's nice to have the clues on how to look. That's great. It's fun, yes. I was hoping you'd say that it was fun. Good, good tool to initially begin digesting what you're seeing, yes. Um, like doing it together, that's great, that's great. Um, simple questions that allow different interpretations, wonderful. Hannah says she thinks the drawing aspect is great. Um, yes, I agree, I wish we had time to draw together. Um, but thinking about the way the object is used definitely elevates the level of thinking about, about it. Okay, great, wonderful. Ah, Flannery teaches intro to archeology span at community college and uses a similar activity. That's wonderful. Okay, so that's great. Students, uh, Michaela says students can learn to investigate and develop their independent thoughts. I love it, I love it. So um, I think it's, it's, this is really great uh, for, you know, and you can of course have criticisms of it too. Um, personally, I think it's really great also for helping students work out that an observation is different from an interpretation um, and, and that they should rely on evidence. Um, this is like a life skill, not just a skill in archeology. span um, evidence, even if it's what you see for yourself, but that's the evidence um, to draw their hypotheses about an object. So really briefly, I'll just say um, about this. Uh, it's a funerary stele. Yes, it's from a tomb. Um, it is uh, belonged to a man named Henny. This is Henny. Um, and he has symbols of authority uh, in his hands. He has um, an offering table. Believe it or not, these are actually loaves of bread. We can talk about any questions if you want. Um, and a bunch of food. It's the stuff that he wants in the afterlife. Um, and this would have uh, been in a, a place in his tomb where people could come and leave food offerings uh, for him. And the text says, uh, it's a standard kind of text that we call the offering formula. Um, uh, before I say what it says, I'll just tell you that like the king is basically the intermediary between the people and the gods and the gods are the only reason why anyone can do anything. Um, so the, the, it might sound a little cryptic, but um, it's like the, the gods allowing him to have a great afterlife. So it says an offering which the king gives to Anubis, it's a god, who is on his mountain, the one who is in the place of embalming, uh, lord of the necropolis and in all his good places so that he may give a good offering for the high official, the sole companion, these are some titles, the honored one, Henny, um, of, and here's your list uh, for whoever said the grocery list. This is what Henny wants in the afterlife. A thousand breads, a thousand beers, a thousand fell, a thousand oxen, a thousand of every good thing for uh, the high official, the royal, royal seal bearer and honored one, Henny who was beloved by his father, blessed by his mother and ruler of their house. That probably means that he had some role in upkeeping their estate. So we actually know a lot about Henny. This is a real ancient Egyptian person and we get to learn a lot um, about him from this object. Uh, this is what it used to look like in the gallery. Sorry for this awful iPhone photo from like 2015. Um, that object, by the way, is from this place called Naga Eder uh, in Egypt and this is the kind of archeological context that it would have come from, although we don't have photos of its actual context, but this is a similar monument. It's a type called a stela, it contains information about a person. And this is the um, like top view and the side view of this tomb. And you can see that it like would have been placed um, sort of like blocking up the doorway to get to the burial chamber. So people could come into the tomb and they could leave stuff here. And this is the, um, the remnants of offerings left for Henny's Ka, for his um, kind of soul. So I love engaging people with objects like this that belong to named people because it's really important. Um, it was really important to the Egyptians that their names be remembered and talking about Henny as a person is a form of respect, especially because we have part of his tomb in the museum. So, Hope you enjoyed that. Um, everything that you've heard up to this point really 
shaped me as an archaeologist and as an Egyptologist and as a museum educator. And as I kind of came into my own over the past decade of working with different audiences in museums, um, I developed a set of principles for myself for teaching about the ancient world with museum objects. Um, and here they are. So the first one is quality time over quantity. So you should have, um, if possible, fewer objects, more time spent with each object. Prioritize the material encounter. If you can touch it or see it up close, like in the culture lab, you should. You should address provenance and context whenever you can. Give personhood back to ancient people, like we were just talking about Henny as a real person. Draw connections to contemporary issues, make it relevant. Um, it might be the ancient past, but trust me, there's a lot that it has to say uh, in relation to the present. Um, and be clear about how we know what we know. And you can probably see the echo there of uncovering ancient Egypt. Um, sure, you can see in every one of these, the influence of those experiences that I had at the Hafen Referent at the Rose de Museum. Um, and I got the chance recently to actually put these in writing. So Pinar, who was our speaker two weeks ago, um, edited this uh, great volume, an educator's handbook for teaching about the ancient world. It's available free online. We're gonna put the link in the chat. Um, and so I have an essay where I, I outline some strategies for um, using those principles, putting them into action. So to tie all of these ends up, and you've heard a lot, lots of different stuff so far this afternoon, I thought I could just spend the last few minutes sharing some of the ways that I've been teaching with our Egyptian collection at the Harvard Art Museums which put those principles and all those influences into action. So remember I said that most of what I do is college level teaching and it's not just college level teaching, it's actually interdisciplinary college level teaching. Um, I almost never work with art history or archeology span classes because um, those folks do their own teaching in the museums most of the time. Um, and I'm really proud to be able to take the ancient world and make it relevant to other subjects. So I'm going to give you two examples here um, of two objects I used just a few weeks ago for an undergraduate class called Texts in Transition. It's basically about scripts and languages and how texts perform different functions that go beyond just being written and read. Anyone know what kind of object this is? You can put it in the chat. If you're an Egyptologist, <laughs> I was going to say, you have to keep your mouth shut, uh, an ushavti. Um, we have lots of exclamation marks in the chat. A <laughs> couple of people who've seen this one before too. So this, uh, this is a funerary figurine called ushavti and it would have been, uh, basically this, this is a figurine that gets up and does your chores for you in the afterlife. We can talk more about it in the questions if you want, but um, that's not why I'm showing it to you really to talk about that function. I'm showing it to you because I want to know you know, based on what I just told you about that class, it's a class about text, like what kinds of questions could you ask about this object with undergrads that relate to text? Pop those in the chat. Why is the text actually embedded in the object? Thank you. Yeah, so you can probably see that this is impressed. It's not painted on. It's actually part of the fabric, the material of this figurine. It, and in fact, this figurine was made in a mold. So it was part of the original conception of how this would look. The text is part of the mold. Uh-huh, okay. What about, there's something about the back of this that could uh, bring up an interesting question about text. Why does the text not go all the way around? Michaela, thank you. Yeah, so um, not only that, First of all, that's a really great question because there's actually a reason why there's a pillar here. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, the fact that there's a pillar on the back that splits the text is one of the ways we know how, how to date this, how to give it an archeological date. Um, why is there no text on the back head or feet, even on the front? Yeah, so, so what I was thinking, Michaela, when you said um, about it not going all the way around is that you'd have to know, you could ask a question about how you read it if you're gonna read it because you, this actually, because it doesn't go all the way around, you have to turn it and turn it back again. There's some kind of implied motion of using the object um, that you have to go from right to left and then right to left again, and then right to left again. Um, you could talk about reading direction, um, questions about materiality, why this medium, why this material, why this form, uh, what's the relationship between material and text? 
uh, because it was made in a mold. What uh, can we say about the replication of this text? Um, why does this text survive? And this, by the way, is actually an excerpt from another text. This is an excerpt from the Book of the Dead. You may have heard of the Book of the Dead. Um, so this is a text that survives as part of another one. What's that relationship like? Um, so those are just some of the questions that we did ask with those students. And again, this class does not have to do with ancient Egypt. It um, is still using this object in a really provocative way. Um, that's the kind of learning that I really like to do at the undergrad level. I love the interdisciplinary stuff. And, and I think that a lot of those big questions and thinking outside of the box like that, uh, I, I, that's really got a basis in everything that I was just telling you um, that I've had experiences with at the Hacker Refer and the RISD. I also wanna say that next week I'm using this in a geology class. Um, because the material is really amazing. Uh, it's a quartz or silica base. Um, and so there's a lot to say about the material as a geological thing too. This one, give you a glimpse of this for a second. Um, what kind of object is this? Does anyone wanna guess? And I'll just tell you right now, it's not stone that you're seeing. And if you look at the edges, you might be able to figure out what the material is. Paper, yeah. <laughs> It's not papyrus, it's paper. It's a modern object. It was made probably in the 19th century, possibly early 20th century, but probably 19th century. And um, it's called a squeeze. This is a paper impression. It was pressed into a stone relief in Egypt, it was made for tourists so they could take away part of like the monument with them. And these are actually really destructive. Um, in classical archeology, span people still use them. Um, it, it's sort of a different practice. We don't use them in Egypt anymore. But um, this is the impression of an ancient Egyptian text from a temple. Um, so it's, it's paper, you can talk about replication, you can talk about the fact that this is the reverse, um, you know, what side are you looking at? Um, you could talk about the fact that it's excerpted, the text continues. There's a lot more to this that we are not seeing and someone decided that this is the part that they wanted to preserve and, and sell to someone. And with those students, I even asked the question like, is this the same text as, as it is on the temple or is it a new text? Because when you press paper into something, it picks up all kinds of damage and crevices and things that weren't part of the original composition. And also sometimes it picks up, um, it doesn't pick up parts that you were expecting. Like this is really blurry. That's probably fully articulated in the original temple. So um, is it a different text once it's made? Um, so that's, that's, that's really interesting too. So I think that that's a, a great example of something um, that I've done very recently with some objects from our Egyptian collection. Um, and uh, those interdisciplinary encounters, there are a million that I could talk about. So I'm always happy to answer questions about that, that kind of work. Um, remember back at the beginning, I told you about the professional development workshop that I did with some sixth grade uh, teachers when we started with this photo. We don't have a regular middle school program at the Harvard Art Museums. So one of the ways to get around that is to teach the teachers how to do things on their own, um, both in their classrooms and on self-guided visits. Um, so that program that we did was designed to help them augment their teaching about Egypt by mulling over some big questions that students can grapple with um, and by modeling some creative strategies for getting students to think critically with artifacts as primary sources. We did lots of stuff. We used the Art Study Center, which is a space like the Culture Lab, um, where we spoke to um, staff from our uh, conservation uh, center. And uh, we thought about the questions that students could be asking about materials, but we had the materials there with us in the room. Maybe that reminds you a little bit of uncovering ancient Egypt too. Um, here, our paintings conservator is, uh, is using some, some uh, printouts of scientific imaging that she's done. Um, and I know I'm about to run out of time. So I'll say we also did some stuff in our materials lab. We did some making. This is uh, the teachers working through whether or not this relief carving activity is something viable that they could do with their students in their art classrooms to learn about reliefs. Remember I talked about raised and sunk relief um, and to think about the craft process with their students. Um, I have more to say about this. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't. Um, but I can take some questions about it. They actually came up with their own worksheet that's kind of like the one that's being used for Think Like an Archaeologist at the RISD Museum, but it's really, um, they came up with it themselves based on their experience. Uh, and there's a lot of other stuff that we're doing online now uh, in the era of COVID, which has presented a lot of challenges, but also 
a lot of really amazing opportunities to engage people with the ancient world with teaching and learning in the online space. So um, I wanna thank uh, all of these lovely people. I also wanna say that if you're interested in Think Like an Archaeologist, please contact Mariani Lefestetnis at the RISD Museum or I can put you in touch with her. She's the person who um, runs that program from the RISD Museum side. She'd be happy to talk to you about it.